Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello, my friend, and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 233. Today, we're going to take a look at what so many records and record collections have in common, and that is that they are lists. Now, that may sound pretty straightforward, but there's a lot more to a list than meets the eye. A list of names, places, or other information has a lot to tell us, and they can be used in very unique ways. So I've invited professional genealogist Carrie Taplin to the show today to join me for a conversation about what is so lovely about lists. So that's coming up. Now, you know, I love to podcast and sitting at this microphone is one of my favorite places to be. But I did spend part of my summer vacation this year sitting somewhere very different working. (laughs) And that was in the cabs of combines and tractors. If you've been following me on Instagram, and you can do that just by going to instagram.com slash genealogy gems podcast or searching for genealogy gems podcast in the app, then you know that I have spent a bit of my time this summer getting a taste of some of the work that many of my ancestors did and probably that many of your ancestors did. And that's farming. Those of you who are Genealogy Gems Premium members, well, you already know a little bit about this adventure because I told you a bit about it in Premium Podcast Episode 174. So the deal is that we have a a very close friend and his wife who own his grandfather's homestead, which was originally filed back in 1904 in North Dakota. And a few years back, Bill went up there to help him kind of open it back up after he inherited it from his dad. And they just kind of got things up and running. And so this year, we both went up and we helped out with uh, this year's harvest of their oats crops. And it's so cute because they have a sign in the field that says, we're growing up to be Cheerios. (laughs) And that's exactly what they're for. Um, He grows oats for Cheerios, the, the breakfast cereal. Now, of course, we had equipment that our ancestors may not have had, certainly, which makes the job a bit easier. I learned to drive the combine and disc the fields with the tractors. But in many ways, things really haven't changed that much. And I think one of the things that really struck me was how the farming community out there pulls together. Now, let me put this in perspective. The homestead was out on 240 acres. And Canada is about two miles down the dirt road. So we're pretty far north in North Dakota. Now the house on the property has fallen into disrepair. As you can imagine, it's a much older house. It's really harsh conditions out there. And for the last couple of decades, his father had lived in town. So our friend, when he inherited the the homestead, he bought an old farmhouse in the nearby town where he grew up. Now, here's the perspective. The town has about 50 people. (laughs) So we're talking pretty remote, and folks are scattered on various farms miles apart. But when a tractor was in need of repair, within the hour, a neighbor would be pulling up ready to crawl under it alongside our friend to work on it till it was fixed. And when a piece of equipment was needed that he didn't have... Sure enough, soon it'd be rolling down the road from a neighboring farm um, ready to pitch in to get the work done. Everyone had one eye on the sky at all times to watch the ever-changing weather out there, and it was very (laughs) ever-changing. And there was such a commitment by all of them to make sure that no neighbor was left with unharvested crops before a storm hit. And storms did come. So even though the combines of today are motorized, massive machines with air conditioning and stereos, the work ethic, the commitment, and the community is unchanged from when his granddad first filed his homestead claim in 1904. Bill and I felt very blessed to be a part of it. Um, It was a ton of work, but something I wouldn't have missed for the world. So next time you eat your Cheerios at breakfast, think of us. All right, well, the next thing on our list 
is to talk to Carrie Taplin about lists. So we're going to do that right after this. Our sponsor for this episode is MyHeritage. They have over 70 million members worldwide. Now, if you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, MyHeritage is the place that you want to be. I uploaded my family tree hoping for a breakthrough in my German family line, and that breakthrough happened really quickly. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany, and that was my first international cousin contact. And my heritage has a unique and powerful search system. It's called Record Matches. Now, this constantly calls over 8 billion historical records for your family. It's also the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. So find out what MyHeritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. If you've been doing genealogy for any length of time, then you've probably encountered a list. Now they come in all shapes and sizes. And while at first glance, they may seem pretty straightforward, there might be more to them. Now, Carrie Taplin is a certified genealogist out of Flukerville, Texas, and she says it's worth taking the time to really examine lists carefully because they can help you potentially glean the proof that you might be needing for your research questions. Carrie currently serves on the board of the Association of Professional Genealogists, and she's the owner of Genealogy Pants. She provides speaking, research, and consultation services. She focuses on the Midwest and the Great Lake states, which I believe is an area that she's very familiar with on a personal level and, of course, methodology. She's here today on the show to help you learn how to use lists to find genealogical proof. Welcome to the show, Carrie. Hi, thanks for having me. And you are from the Midwest, right? Or the Great Lakes? Yes, I was born in Bowling Green, Ohio, and that's not very far from the shores of Great Lake Erie. (laughs) Ah, fantastic. Well, Mm -hmm. you know, it's it's always nice. We specialize in those areas where our ancestors come from, and then we kind of spread out from there. And I know that you help. We do, do client work as well, right? I do. I take clients um, to do the research for them, or I often consult with uh, other genealogists that just get stuck or, you know, want somebody else to read uh, an article they're working on, stuff like that. So I do both research and consultations um, for clients as well. Well, we'll just consider this our personal consultation with you today. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds good. Uh, Because sometimes we get stuck. And Hmm? gosh, I think nearly every time, of course, we sit down to do genealogy research, we're going to run into a list. And there are loads of them out there. So I thought maybe you could just start us off by giving us a list of the lists that our (laughs) listeners might run into. Absolutely. Uh, I do have quite a list of lists. And so I won't read every single list that I've captured, you know, in my list. (laughs) But, um, (laughs) you know, it's basically anytime you get a list of people, typically it's people when we're dealing with genealogy. So indexes are a list. There are list. There's a couple of different kinds of lists too. Like there's a list that just happens in documents, but then there's a list of people's making like indexes. Um, So uh, indexes of any kind, censuses are probably the most uh, recognized list of people. Um, Of course, there's like church membership lists, city directories, um, militia rolls, petitions. Uh, I'm thinking about cemetery books, you know, where societies would go around and create a a listing of all the people buried in the cemetery. Uh, Voter lists, uh, yearbooks can be a list. Uh, I have some fun yearbook examples that I've run into. Uh, tax lists. um, Let's see. Uh, In the newspaper, you'll find various kinds of lists. I'm thinking about hotel registrations. They used to list everybody that had come in and registered at the hotel uh, in in the newspaper. Yeah. So those are fun. Um, Members of a club or society were sometimes published in the newspaper. Um, Let's see. Letters at the post office. You might have seen some of those lists. Uh, You know, there's these letters are at the post office to be picked up. You know, that happened before we had our postal delivery service. Mm -hmm. So 
all kinds of lists. Um, you know, I could go on. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. But yeah, any kind, anytime you're running into a list of that, that uh, there's a lot to be gathered from it, for sure. Exactly. And you mentioned, of course, so many of the lists that we're running into are alphabetical. And mm-hmm. oftentimes, of course, by last name, which is something I'm always reminding people when they're Googling, mm-hmm. we're not always going to Google the name first name, last name, we're going to do last name, first name, because yeah. that's the way they're listed, right? That's so right. Just yeah. being aware of how lists are kind of formed. Yep. Um, of course, we might run into, as you mentioned, lists that aren't by name. I was thinking about um, like prison inmates could be listed by number. Oh, yeah, yeah, right? exactly. Yep. Or I think, you know, burial plots, you were saying do it by burial plot, the number of the plot versus the actual name of the person. So yeah, As we think about these various ways that information can kind of be organized in lists, the way the list maker decided to create it, that really tells us something, doesn't it? I mean, it does. Yep. How do you analyze the significance of the way that the list is constructed? Well, you can come at it from a couple of different angles. Um, sometimes I look at a list, and if it's been alphabetized, you brought that up first. Um, it's typically depend. You know, of course, this depends on what the the list is about. Uh, but typically, that's a recreated list. Uh, usually, people didn't gather their information in alphabetical order. I'm thinking about the census taker, and I have seen censuses that are in alphabetical order. <laughs> So that means oh. somebody bit back later and recopied a list, right? right. And so um, usually that was early, really, really early in New England uh, censuses. I've seen that. But um, anyway, you know, that means that there's a potential for error then as well. So if you're looking at something that's been alphabetized, you're kind of going to need to take that with a grain of salt. And perhaps there's a way to locate an original, um, you know, document that 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 alphabetical list was created from maybe um sometimes i find them in order of a location that's an easy one with the census of course but tax lists i'm thinking they're often in order of location and then they're often al- uh, alphabetized maybe not fully usually it's like all the a's are together all the b's are together but they're all mixed in um you know in that grouping um chronological order often i find that in um lists of especially like deceased you know people or births birth registers registers, something like that. So they're typically in chronological order. And I think that tells you a lot about um, what the intent was. And it's usually not for genealogists. (laughs) It's usually for the purposes of the entity that's having that list created. So that then will also tell you something about the importance of the list and the, um, you know, the arrangement. So uh, just paying attention to that and then thinking. So the analysis part then comes from like thinking about what was that list created for? Why is it in this order? And what does that then tell me about my people or the, you know, the, the research subjects, if you will. Great so it's point. important to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you just mentioned a couple of really great little to do items that we could do when we're looking at these lists and we're doing this analysis. Uh, one, you said, be aware of the potential for error. So we're looking for yep. errors. We're cross referencing what we're seeing in the list with other yep. sources that we're working mm-hmm. with, of course. Yep. You also said that there was a, a to do item there, which is, hey, is there an original? Mm-hmm. You know, maybe you you feel you know, we always feel like, oh, I found it, I found it. But that's could be the tip of the iceberg, or it could be yeah. one <laughs> version of it, right? <laughs> yes. And I love that you mentioned chronological order, because mm-hmm. there again, We've just learned something about time frame when we were focused on names. Yeah. We're, we're missing this information. It's trying to, to tell us right there in front of us, which is there's something going on in a certain order of time. So yep. all really great. I love to do items. I, I like mm-hmm. to make lists when I'm doing yeah. my genealogy <laughs> research. You uh-huh. know, what can Me I do? I love it. Yeah. yeah. Really, what do we do? What do we? What are the next steps? Mm-hmm. So you're talking about the significance of how a list is constructed, and you mentioned the census, which yep. is a great example, of course, of a a list that has other background documents. I'm thinking about the enumerator instructions. Yes. So, so there is a whole document. It doesn't just pop up on the screen when we find our ancestor in the census on the screen. We're looking at a at a, a census document and. 
right? We may not realize those instructions exist, but those Mm -hmm. instructions or the background on the list can really help us get so much more out of it. Exactly. Yep. And I think a lot of people, particularly when you're new to genealogy, you don't realize when you're searching Mm -hmm. in Ancestry or Family Search or MyHeritage, you don't always realize they do provide the background on on their sources. Talk a little bit about that and the importance of reading, in a sense, the history of the list. Exactly. Well, that's a great point. Um, specifically to the census, um, there's a, I don't know if there's a way for you to share a link, but sure. if you just Google, if you just Google, um, uh, measuring America and, uh, probably census.gov, like if you do a search for those, because it's on the census website, mm-hmm. there is a PDF download of all the census instructions for all of the censuses that we can, um, access at this point. And so it's really interesting to read, uh, that that's probably the easiest one to find the background for, um, for one of these created, uh, documents. And you get some great information, like not every census was created on the same day, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes it's mandated that the date that the collection is on June 1st, right? So even if you're reaching a house on June 10th, you're to ask questions as if it's June 1st. (laughs) And that's that's specified in the instructions. So if somebody's died between June 1st and June 10th, and they're listed, that's because they were alive on June 1st, you know, as per the instructions. And I'm thinking about this one specifically, because I just spoke about this the other day. And that's in the 1900 census that that rule specifically. So it varies across each census. So it's important to read those census instructions. Um, If I'm thinking about another kind of list, I'm thinking about tax lists, okay? Tax lists have uh, a law behind them. So there's a statute that you can go and look up, usually in the historical statutes of that state, that tells you what the tax laws were. And so then you know exactly what's being taxed. Not every tax list has a great little um, header at each column. (laughs) So you don't necessarily know what that column is for or what they're actually taxing when they're putting a check mark in a box. So if you're really struggling to figure that out, sometimes... um, um, you know, a publication has been done. I th- I'm thinking about Tennessee. I'm pretty sure I was doing some research in Tennessee, or maybe I found it through Googling. But I got a document, a PDF, that was just a summation of the tax laws at the time. So you can find this out either just by finding somebody that's, you know, done a little write-up about it or by looking in the actual historical statutes for tax laws. Um, and so that's the background of taxes. Uh, you know, how do you find out what their instructions were? And you just got to do that with every kind of list. You got to just... Think about who's creating this document. You know, if it's a government entity, what's it based on? And it's usually a law. You know, it's usually from some kind of a statute. So um, just trying to figure that out and seeing what their um, rules or instructions are for creating that document. And then you'll have some of your answers. Maybe not all of them, (laughs) but you'll have some of those, those answers to questions that don't make sense. Yeah, that's a great point. And yep. it can sound like, oh, that's a little bit of extra work. Extra work, you know, that, I know. Yep. My ancestor is not going to be named in those instructions. But what you're really yep. talking about is educating ourselves so that mm-hmm. we're not contributing to the errors that get out exactly. there. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good way to look at it, for yeah, sure. Yeah, it's an investment, right, in the accuracy. And, you know, when you are on a genealogy database, of course, um, it, it, most of them have a link. They'll say, "Here's the yeah. here's the the history of this record," mm-hmm. and like you said, more about this record or something. Yeah, it's called. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. So mm-hmm. now it can be tempting when you get a list that you just kind of scan it and you grab your ancestor's name out of it and then you move on because you're all excited and you've got some other agenda that you're trying to you know accomplish. <laughs> exactly. But we would be leaving a lot of genealogical gold behind if we do that. If we just grab the name. What should we be looking for that is of significance in the list that are other items beyond our ancestor? Exactly. That's a great question. Um, So sometimes it might just be a name. That might just be a list that's a list. I'm thinking about petition lists that I was looking at recently. It just says these people signed this petition to um, make Bowling Green the county seat of Wood County because prior to it being the county seat, it was actually Perrysburg, which is way in the north part of the county. And Bowling Green was in the center of the county. So they wanted to move the county seat, which makes sense to me. Everybody can get there more easily, right? Mm. <laughs> so why my ancestors signed this petition? And it's just a list of names, um, you know, and so that you might only have names but it tells me a little bit about his beliefs or his you know uh, thoughts at the time like he thought that was a good idea 
Now, I should caveat that by saying he lived in Bowling Green, so he probably, <laughs> you know, had some personal reasons for wanting to move it as well. But, you know, it gives you a little bit of insight, some of those lists. Now, other lists might, like I mentioned with tax lists, there might be columns at the top that tells you what certain things mean. You know, uh, there might be check marks or dollar amounts or something like that. Um, and so you've got to pay attention to some of those other details. They might help give you information with a little bit of um thinking and analysis, you know, what does this mean? Um, I took Elizabeth Schoen Mill's advanced methodology class, her last one. We didn't know it was her last one at the time, mm. but I took her class. And one of her examples that she shared with us had to do with this. It was just a list of names and dollar amounts and not much more. And we were to try to figure out what that meant. And everybody's uh, dollar amount was a little different. Well, it turned out through, um, you know, some research and, and some thinking about it, that it was their mileage to come into jury duty. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was, it was like you had to kind of study the rest of the document. You kind of had to figure out what, what possibly could have been going on. And we had to do some looking into some statutes about the mileage rate. Um, and so that told us how many miles away from the courthouse everybody lived. I mean, it was just an amazing example. And so I always think about that one. You don't have to necessarily have a column <laughs> top to figure it out. Um, that, that one just really drove that home to me. So the other thing. Thing, not besides just the columns and the other information that might be there that I would recommend people pay attention to is the other people in the list. Now, to talk about Elizabeth Schoen Mills again, she coined the phrase the fan club, which stands for the friends, associates, and neighbors. So not everybody that you might use to solve a problem is necessarily an, a relative, right? Mm -hmm. So it could be a friend, could be an associate, could just be a neighbor, you know, uh, that's next door in the census enumeration or whatever. Look at those other names. They will probably show up in other documents. So if you start paying attention to some of those patterns, uh, you're going to learn a lot about your ancestor and can really help solve some of those problems. So I use it a lot for fan club, um, you know, establishment, if you will, just trying to figure out who the other people are that they interacted with a lot. They'll show up on other lists. And I'm visualizing you doing this, you know, and when yeah. we are looking at a list and we are going beyond the ancestor, we are compiling who are the neighbors, who are the fans. I know people are probably thinking, ooh, how does she organize that? I'd yeah. love to take a, take a detour down that alley and let sure. us know how does Carrie yeah. organize that kind of stuff when it's a, it, the project gets a little bigger than you first thought. It does. That's for sure. I use a lot of spreadsheets. Um, I have a spreadsheet system, if you will, and it's a lot with the census. I do a lot with the census in, um, you know, doing a, a census survey, if you will, I'll, I'll usually go 10 households above and 10 households below my ancestor and start a list there. Then I might look at landowner maps, who are the neighbors, you know, and I can kind of cross reference them with that census, right? Um, I will look at tax lists, I will look at, um, you know, then I start digging into my ancestors personal documents, who were the witnesses on their deeds on their um, uh affidavits for the military pensions, you know, like who are the people that are signing off? You know, they don't just typically pull people off the street <laughs> to say, <laughs> hey, will you sign, you know, will you witness this document? Typically, they would bring somebody in with them, you know, to the courthouse or, or you know, however they did it. And so it was usually somebody they knew, somebody that was, um, you know, a neighbor or a friend, somebody they trusted. You know, I'm thinking about people who were administrators on estates that didn't have the same surname. Those are always interesting people to me who are these guys that I don't recognize, mm -hmm. you know. And so um, I just do a lot of that and I do it in a spreadsheet system. And so in a spreadsheet, you can really easily sort, right? You know, if I want to look at right. look at it by date, I click that that column. If I want to look at it by last name, I can click that column. <laughs> you know, if I want to look at it by document type, I can click that column. And so I just really start with a spreadsheet. That's typically how I do it. And I don't do this across the board with every single ancestor I've ever researched. I start doing this when I get into some brick wall type situations. So um, don't think I do this all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but when I have a real, real hard problem, Problem. This is how I start really kind of getting into the nuts and bolts of it. I just start a spreadsheet. And I, I love that because so often I get questions, email questions from listeners, and they will hit a brick wall and they'll say, where else should I look? Mm -hmm. You know, what's that one silver bullet that you can send yeah. me to? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so I can go find that document that I have. I would found. like to know the answer to that as yeah. well. You well, can let me know. <laughs> and I think the silver bullet is actually what you're talking about, which yeah. is, oh, you got to take a big, deep breath. 
and mm-hmm. say, we're going for a deep dive. I'm going to have to maybe pull out the spreadsheet. Like you said, you don't use it for everything. Mm-mm. But um, it's really about branching out into the fan club, the friends, associates, and neighbors. It's about um, compiling the data. You're really talking about not only compiling it, but then twisting and turning it and analyzing yep. it in different forms. Yeah, but being able to manipulate it yes. so that it shows you a new pattern. Yes. And that's where I think some of the the really big ahas come from is when yeah. you start to go, oh, this all makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> now, you're, you're talking about the fan club, and that kind of brings me to my next question, which is based on an example I saw in your presentation. Now, the presentation that you do is called Using Lists to Find Proof. Yeah. So oftentimes you're doing a search and I'm thinking about your example of the Bureau of Land Management, um, yes. which is the the website where we can look at uh, U.S. land records and, and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. And you put in the name and you get a single record or you get a couple of records in a list, right? Yes. And what we have to remember, I guess, is that this list that we just generated is actually part of this massive indexed list that's mm-hmm. the search engine is pulling <laughs> from, right? Yes. There are lists beyond lists. And I, I think in that example, when you have just a couple of items in, in the list, you showed how you kind of use the data and mm-hmm. use the system itself, the website itself, to tap back into the bigger list and be able to pull more information, really going back to this fan principle. Tell us yeah. a little bit about that. So yeah, on that BLM website, um, you can search not just by name, but you can actually search by the um, the township and range uh, land description. So mm-hmm. I do that a lot just to see who else is the next door neighbor, <laughs> basically, yes. who's, who's owning land next door. So if I find my guy and it says township 39 North range 28 West, well, then I can just go back to the front and only search by that um, and see who is owning land next door. And of course, you can go, you know, as far out as you want. I typically kind of stay within a couple of uh, blocks around him. I don't get too big. Each one of those blocks, those squares is a one one square mile. So that gives you a a scale by which you're looking. And so it it's really, really handy. I really love that uh, website allows you to do that because it's so nice to be able to see who is living next door or owning land that didn't necessarily mean they lived next door. They could have just been um, a landowner. My ancestor, Chester Dimmick, he was one of my examples. He owned a bunch of land in Minnesota. He never lived there. <laughs> he, was, he was a land speculator, I guess. And um, I didn't inherit any of this wealth that he obviously made, but... <laughs> Um, you know, he just bought up a bunch of land as it went on sale. It was a pretty good deal. And um, I have I haven't looked for the deeds when he actually sold the land, but it's on my to do list. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, you know, but yeah, I really liked being able to see who is owning land next door, you know, and that starts to create your own fan club. And I, um, I did find a couple of other guys that were from the same town he was from in New England. So they must have gone together. You know, they were like, Oh, let's go do this uh, business opportunity you know, or whatever. So oh, and see, that's so interesting that yeah. when you come up to this little cluster of people, then to go back and look yeah. and see, oh, have they been traveling <laughs> together, whatever, that is so yep. cool. Yeah. And, and there, there they were, they were neighbors in New England, so or in New Hampshire. So yeah, <laughs> that technique you're talking about at the BLM reminds mm-hmm. me of many times I've been in the familysearch.org website, and I find a name. So I find my great grandmother in some records from East Prussia. And you can take batch numbers and go back and oh, yeah. Pull up the whole batch and then see the index complete list. Where's this record come from? Yeah. And it was amazing how it revealed all these other names that I recognized. Mm-hmm. Isn't that interesting? I just get goosebumps sometimes when those things happen. Yes. <laughs> it's like, oh, they weren't living in isolation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> stuff with and, other and most of the time, although I don't know, some of my relatives I question, but yeah. they weren't <laughs> making you know crazy out of the blue decisions. Yeah. They were actually working with people and people. Exactly. In continuity. Mm-hmm. So lots of ways to when you pull your search list results to tap back into the bigger list and to remember that there's a bigger list behind mm-hmm. the list. Exactly. So yeah, on these d- databases these days, definitely, for yes. sure. It's really fun to kind of see how you can manipulate that, <laughs> mm-hmm. see what other results you can get. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to have you take a minute here at this point to kind of talk about proof and explain to people who are listening that, you know, they hear that turn, but 
Talk about it from the BCG standpoint as well. What constitutes proof? What are we trying to do here? Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, The genealogical proof standard is something probably people have heard of before. It's a five-step process. And it's basically a five-step process to almost guarantee. I I hate to say guarantee, but almost. If you really follow these five steps, you're going to come to some level of proof. You know, and in genealogical writing, we use what I call weasel words. (laughs) You know, (laughs) you say probably a lot or Mm -hmm. possibly or whatever. And so, you know, there's really, it's really hard to say I definitely proved it, but um, you get real close, you know, and so you can use some of those weasel words. Um, But the genealogical proof standard really helps you get to that point. So you start off with your reasonably exhaustive research or exhaustive research. (laughs) Yes. You know, you just got to make sure you hit all of the, all of the data points, all of the record sets that you can possibly hit and see if, you know, that answers your questions, you know, gives you a a really good solid basis of research for your, your research problem. Um, You want to make sure, of course, that you're writing full and complete source citations. That is the basis for people who read what you've written to understand where you got your information and not just this book or that, you know, that book, but Mm -hmm. exactly the quality of your research. So are you looking at an abstract or are you looking at the original? You know, like that's what a source citation will also tell them. Um, And and it's also great for people who maybe are also researching this family and want to see the sources you're looking at. So it tells them how to find them. The third one, of course, tests of analysis and correlation, which is kind of what we're talking about mostly here with lists is, you know, corroborating information you get from one document to another. What does that document mean, you know, in terms of the laws of the time, the enumerator instructions, all of that, you know, kind of putting all that together and making sure it tests out, making sure it makes sense, Mm -hmm. you know, in relation to each other. Then conflict resolution is very important. That's the fourth step. And you can sometimes resolve conflicts by explaining why a conflict might be there, Uh, you know enumerators didn't follow the instructions. And here's why I know that, you know, based Mm -hmm. on these other documents or whatever, you know, you've got to be able to explain why the conflicts are there and and resolve them in some way. And then, of course, the final one is you have to write it up. If it just sits in your software, sits on Ancestry, uh, sits in your filing cabinet, your binder, it does nothing. (laughs) It's as if it didn't exist. So you've got to write these things up. And I am an advocate of writing up short things, writing up a small reports on, it can be really small, but you've got to start writing it up. Later on, you can put these smaller pieces together into a larger piece, but write up small parts and submit them somewhere. Local societies are always looking for content. Mm -hmm. If it's a bigger project, you know, of course, there's the larger uh, journals, state level journals or things such as the NGS quarterly or the New England quarterly, you know, all those um, scholarly journals all the way down to the local society. They're always looking for content. So getting it to a place where it's going to be most appreciated is also very important. And, um, you know, of course, you can write the book. You know, I think people get... (laughs) People get overwhelmed with that. Yeah. So that's why I'm really an advocate of doing these small little write-ups. You know, if you just solved a problem about who, um, you know, somebody married, write up your write up your proof. It can be two pages and send it off to a local society that's, you know, where that is, took place or whatever. But start getting your stuff out there. And it's, that's how it benefits everybody. And I think there's such a benefit in doing that because as you write it, sometimes it'll jump out at you. Oh, I missed something. Yes. Or there's a gap here. And I, I'm having a hard time explaining this part, you know, and yep. it really More helps. research. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really helps you double check your work. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. also kind of reinforce th- that you are following a process. We're not just looking for silver bullets. Yeah, exactly. That's a good list. I mm-hmm. like that list. One yes, through five. List. <laughs> I'll have that in the show notes for this episode as well. And I'll have a link to the GPS so that you guys okay, can learn good. more about it too. And I have to talk about on that presentation that you do, you talk about two people with the same name. We all hit that. And boy, you had an example where there must have been a whole page full of people with the same name. Can you share a little bit of that example and how lists play a part in teasing these people apart so we can identify and get proof as to who's who? Yeah. I'm not sure which example you're specifically referring to, but it, it happens all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it happens all the time. Somebody's named, you know, I'm going to use one example that I know for sure. Gilbert Avery. His, yes, that's the one I was thinking Okay, of. good, good. Um, 
his grandpa might have been named Gilbert, right? And so now <laughs> all the brothers want to name somebody after grandpa. And so you have a whole generation of kids named Gilbert Avery. <laughs> so, wow. you know, they're all they're all in the same county, of course, mm-hmm. right? So you've even though Gilbert is a little bit of an unusual name, you'll find counties where you have a whole cluster of people with the same name. And it's because they want to name them after the grandpa. You know, I mean, that's really what it boils down to naming patterns. Right. And so, um, you know, you just got to start working them. You got to kind of start to tease them apart. This is a huge place where the fan club comes into play also. You know, uh, this Gilbert Avery always associated with, you know, John Smith, whereas this Gilbert Avery always associated with, you know, Harry Jones, you know, or whatever. So you kind of start using those lists to tease them apart. And, um, you know, I had an example of creating a list for my own uh, off of uh, Ancestry search, you know, searching in the census. And I just searched for Gilbert Avery in the 1860 census, and there was just a whole bunch of them. Oh, boy. <laughs> a whole bunch of them. I mean, I don't know. That I thought that was enough unique name, but no. Yeah. <laughs> so there were just a whole slew of them. And, um, of course, I'm looking for an approximate birth date, you know, so I can eliminate some of them. But, you know, it still left me with several. And one of them was in Bowling Green, Ohio, which is where I expected him to be. But there was another really good candidate who was in uh, Wisconsin. Now, having just worked on uh, my Dimmix, who lived in New England but had all this land in Minnesota, I did – I was not about to just, you know, write that guy off. So you have to do a little bit of investigation. Um, A lot of it is just looking through other records and saying, is this Gilbert Avery, does he stay put or does he go to Wisconsin, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, uh, I just did some researching in various uh, census records. I think it was the main thing that I did to solve this problem where I started looking at the the Wisconsin uh, Gilbert Avery and I determined – that he was there uh, while my guy was actually in Ohio. So there were two men of the, you know, of the same name, born in the same place, born in the same year. <laughs> but, yeah. um, you know, you just kind of got to use these lists to uh, pull people apart, you know. And then, of course, you've got to um, corroborate it with other research. You know, you can't just base everything off one document. Never, <laughs> never no. in can you do that. So, um, yeah, just it takes a little bit of a uh, little bit of work. And um, I just I love to do these database lists uh, for my own self. OK, I'm really focused on Gilbert Avery. So I just make a whole list of all the Gilberts born in New York in about 1820. And then I start working through them and eliminating those that don't, uh, you know, don't stick to where I, they should be. <laughs> if mm-hmm. you know. um, so, yeah, that's how I that's how I did the Gilbert Gilbert one. Sounds like the the spreadsheet, again, might be a really good tool for something like that, particularly if if it gets big. Exactly. If you are working with something a little less uh, unique, uh, you know, I'm thinking of somebody named John Avery, of course, that would be a lot different. A lot more Avery's, you know, John Avery's than there would be Gilbert's. And so, yeah, definitely putting together a spreadsheet and start looking at where the patterns are or where they're not and eliminating those people, you know, and uh, just kind of working through it. Definitely. You know, what you're really talking about is finding these, let's say you've got five people with the name Gilbert Avery, you want to find them in lists, because a list where he's listed with his family members, he's listed with his, you know, co-workers, he's in the context of yes. other people. That's what makes each one of them extremely unique, isn't it? Exactly. Yep. Gilbert Avery, the uh, Iron Smith versus Gilbert Avery, yes. the farmer versus, mm-hmm. you know, whatever their occupation is at the time. Most of mine are farmers, but <laughs> <laughs> once in a while I get somebody who does something a little more unique. You know, it could be Gilbert Avery who has an apple orchard versus Gilbert Avery who raises pigs. You know, even though right. they might say farmer in the census, if you can look at the agricultural census and see any differences there, that that's helpful. So just another, you know, example, you just got to start teasing them apart by any means possible. (laughs) Now, one of the things you mentioned at the very beginning when we first started chatting was about yearbooks. And I know you had a yearbook page uh, in your presentation where it was a good example because at first glance, if Mm -hmm. you thought, oh, my ancestor is the first name there, it's the first picture. That was not necessarily the case because you you (laughs) literally counted the number of pictures on the page Mm -hmm. and you counted the number of names in the list under those pictures and they did not add up. And that told you something very important, didn't it? It it did. It's really funny. Um, Yes, this yearbook uh, that I have is from 1928 Bowling Green uh, yearbook. My grandma graduated from there. And so I was looking for her and some, you know, what did she do? You know, and she Mm -hmm. turns out she played the violin, you know, and stuff. But anyway, I was looking at this page of yearbooks 
uh, in the yearbook, and I started noticing other names from other parts of my family, not just my father's side, but also my mother's side because we're from the same area. And so I was like, oh, there so and so's on this page, and I wanted to see what they looked like. Well, the first name on the list is George Rogers, and the first picture is very definitely a female. So that was <laughs> so right my first there. There's yeah, that was the first clue. And then I think I counted them up, and there was something like 53 names on the list, but only 50 photos. And so uh. I'm not sure who's who. I I couldn't figure out a way to to figure it out. I was backtracking. Uh, it doesn't you know conveniently say you know not mm-hmm. photographed or anything like they do these days. But um, yeah, it's really kind of a mess. So on this page somewhere are several of my ancestors, but I can't tell which one's which. <laughs> well, and that that would be. I mean, I could just see you could potentially do it, but that's a huge project. You'd have to yeah. research each person on the page. Find see another if photo. you can't find yeah. another photo. Yeah, go to, fam- you know, maybe Ancestry and see if there's photos on family trees yeah. or whatever. Yep. But even then, oh my gosh. Yeah. But it's, well, the other thing about this list is it's not even in alphabetical order exactly. It's, oh. it's, it sort of is, and then it starts over. It's like it's with W <laughs> and then it starts with some more A's, B's, C, you know, it, and it does it several times on this list. So I don't know what this list is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and a good example of if you understand the creation of the list, the yearbook yeah. got all the names of the students, but didn't necessarily get a photograph of every person. They weren't right. there that day. They were sick. And well, and in late 1928, I don't know, did they charge for the photograph? Right. Maybe they just couldn't afford it. I, right. you know, I don't know. Nowadays, they photograph everybody and you don't have to buy the package, but at least they've got your picture. For yeah, the they have the picture for the yearbook. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know the process at the time. So. Okay. And no support document for that, is there? No. <laughs> Here's what I the mean, staff was thinking. I mean, maybe if they still had some school administrative records yeah. somewhere in the, like the archive in, at the Bowling Green State University, maybe I could figure it out. But it's just not high on my priority exactly. list. Exactly. <laughs> oh, I love this. Well, we could. You know, who knew there was so much to list? Anything I haven't asked you that you feel like is a really uh, important item to hit before we wrap um, up about lists? Let's see. Uh, I just, I think I'd really like to make sure people don't skip lists. That's my main message about talking about lists. And, um, you know, don't skip over looking at them because maybe there's some lack of identifying information. Maybe it says John Avery and you're not sure that's the guy you're looking for because it's too common of a name, right? Well, you still need to record it. (laughs) You put it Mm -hmm. in your spreadsheet, right? Put it in, list everything you can about it in your spreadsheet. And then later it may come back to be an important piece of information. And if you didn't capture it, you would have just completely forgot it. So, um, and the other thing I like to use lists for is just helping find migration patterns too. Um, We talked about people of the same name, but um, I didn't actually talk about migrating, you know, I guess I did mention a little bit with the Wisconsin guy, but, you know, I have some very clear examples in my uh, research where, you know, I'll find them in a list in Bowling Green, Ohio, and then I find them in a list in uh, Audrain County, Missouri, right? And then I find them in a list in Phoenix, Arizona, you know, of some kind. And so I can see very clearly a, a migration pattern too. So I really love to uh, put their life story together and lists are really really useful for doing that. That's a great point that we're Mm -hmm. tapping into lists, sources, but also lists are a powerful tool for us. And as we compile our information and our research, and uh, I love the idea of using the spreadsheets to, to use them so we can sort our lists in any way we need to. Yep. Fantastic. Well, I, I told everybody, I can't let you go until I ask you, how did you end up naming your company and your blog <laughs> genealogy pants at genealogypants.com exactly well so when i decided to do this full time uh i had worked you know part time previously and i was mm-hmm. a stay at home mom for a while but when i finally my kids were old enough going to school i decided to do this full time i was thinking about a business name and i First of all, I was a little bit quirky. I have a little bit quirky sense of humor, first of all. <laughs> so let me start with that. But I was brainstorming with my husband and my, our kids were small at the time, uh, you know, grade school, elementary school. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were just brainstorming and I didn't want something that had anything to do with roots or leaves or, right. you know, the standards. <laughs> I, and I just, I couldn't come up with anything. And finally, uh, I don't remember if, who said it first, he or I, but we kind of came to it in the same way. We always would call our kids, Mr. Fancy Pants or Mr. Smarty Pants, you know, or something like that. And it just came out genealogy pants. So it's kind of like, you know, calling somebody Smarty Pants. <laughs> but I love pants. it. 
that. I yeah. love it. <laughs> and it's stuck and people, you know, ha- remember it. It's like, a, it's more unique. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it's, it's mem- rememberable. Is that not the right word? Memorable. memorable there we yes. go. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, when I look at your website, I see that the, literally the picture of the pants. I, yeah. I kind of, it reminded me think of, you know, as genealogists, we all just put our pants on one leg at a time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? So everybody, even though you think, oh, this person's so smart, this person's been, you know, they're a professional, yeah. whatever. No, yeah. they still have to put on their research pants one That's leg so- at a time and do the work. It's interesting you bring that up. Because when I was first starting out, I had a little bit of starstruck attitude about genealogists, right? The people yeah. speaking at the lectures. And I was like, always in awe of them. Well, you know, and not to, to bring anybody down, but as I got to know them, I had that realization. You yeah. know, I would, I'd made friends in the community and I was like, you know what, you know, Tom Jones, he still puts his pants on <laughs> just one leg at a time, <laughs> you know, and it really kind of helped me be more confident is what it did. Uh-huh. Uh, it just helped me go, you know what, he went through the same journey that I went through, maybe a little different, but the same like learning process. And, you know, I love that one leg at a time. <laughs> That's yeah. exactly how I, I feel a little more confident when I uh, start thinking about it that way. So yeah, my tagline is who wears the pants in your family? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's adorable. <laughs> who's the genealogist in your family is basically, you know, like, exactly. Who's, who's the person? Yep. Oh. Share the stories. Exactly. I love it. So fun. Thank you so much for coming and Absolutely. sharing your expertise and, and talking lists. I think that it really um, has broadened everybody's perspective on the power of lists, both in what Perfect. they find and what they use. And you can learn more and follow Carrie Chaplin at genealogypants.com. Thank you so much, Carrie, for joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay, have you visited backblaze.com slash Lisa yet? If you don't have cloud backup for your computer yet, everything on it is vulnerable to loss. Your pictures, your master genealogy database, files for work, the everyday business of your household, losing all of that at once is as devastating as it sounds. That's why I did my homework and I found a cloud-based backup service provider. I chose Backblaze. It runs in the background 24-7 automatically saving copies of everything, including my precious video files. Did you know that some of the other leading services actually skip your video files when they do the backup? Hello, not good. And Backblaze is so easy to use. I love their free app that allows me to access all my files if I need to from my smartphone or my tablet. Most importantly, the service is totally affordable for real people. It's just $5 a month. So don't wait to ensure that all your files are safe. Do it now. Back them up like I do with Backblaze. Head over to backblaze.com slash Lisa and get that $5 a month deal. Check it out for yourself. You could even do a free trial. That's backblaze.com slash Lisa. Profile America, Wednesday, September 11th. This was a day that didn't exist in colonial America in 1752, as the familiar calendar underwent what is called the Gregorian Correction, switching from the ancient Julian calendar to adjust for errors accumulated over centuries. After September 2nd, the next day was September 14th. The British Parliament's Calendar Act of 1750 had also changed New Year's Day from March 25th to January 1st. As a result, the year 1751 had only 282 days. Since then, with leap years built in, as in 2020, the calendar has remained constant. Calendar production engages some of the country's 24,000 printing establishments, which employ around 390,000 workers. Profile America is in its 23rd year as a public service of the U.S. Census Bureau. Well, thanks so much for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 233. You can find the show notes for this episode in our Genealogy Gems podcast app or any of the apps that you're possibly using to listen to this episode. But of course, one of the easiest ways to get them is to go to genealogygems.com and click on podcast in the menu and head to Genealogy Gems podcast. You'll find us there. It's number 233 and everything we've uh, talked about and lots of photos and things are there on the show notes for you.
And one thing I wanted to mention to you before I let you go is um, my heritage just introduced their new education center. And I'm happy to say that one of my videos from last year at the conference in Oslo is included there. So the scoop with this is, is that they have put together this education center that's on their website. And they say here, it's a new online resource for enhancing your understanding of my heritage's tools, products, and services to help you get the most out of your family history research. And this is a really great idea because uh, when you're investing in using a product or whether, whatever the genealogy website is you're using, it, it's really nice to know that you're getting everything out of it and that you're doing things the most efficient way and you're understanding and gleaning the most from the information that you can. So that's what they're doing here. Um, when you go to education.myheritage.com, you're going to find how-to videos there. And uh, these are step-by-step -step videos they're going to walk you through the different features of my heritage. And I know many of you have uh, joined my heritage. And so this is a great way to make sure that you really understand what all these different features are. There's a lot there. And so I see here right now, there looks to be about 14 videos or so. So, but they're very focused, you know, here's how to invite people to your family tree. Here's how to use the consistency checker. So these are all really super helpful. You'll also find broken out from that, those kind of instructional videos, webinar videos. So these are live and recorded sessions covering in-depth topics from experts in genealogy and DNA testing, because of course, MyHeritage does have a DNA product. So you're going to find uh, videos there, how to find unknown family with MyHeritage DNA, uh, things like unlocking your English and Welsh civil registration records. So you can see it kind of goes in depth into core areas of uh, what they have to offer. Lots of videos there. I see at least 20 here right off the bat. And I'm happy to tell you that one of them is mine. So if you'd like to watch the video of the presentation that I gave at the first ever My Heritage conference that was held in Oslo, Norway in 2018, you can watch that here. If you don't see it on the main page, when you get down to webinars, just click more videos, you'll see it there. It's called How to Find Your Family in Newspapers with Super Search. And that is the Super Search feature at My Heritage. But I really expanded even further into just overall newspaper research. They have a terrific newspaper collection there on My Heritage, so there's lots to find. Check it out. It's called How to Find Your Family History in Newspapers with Super Search. It is at the My Heritage Education Center at education.myheritage.com. And I think you're going to be seeing a lot more information to come and videos. And, and I say information because they've also got articles here. So if you aren't really into watching videos, but you'd like to uh, read up on particular areas to make sure you're getting the most out of using My Heritage. They have lots of articles there organized for you as well. So that's the latest with that. Of course, you can get all the latest of what's going on with Genealogy Gems and the topics we're talking about over at genealogygems.com. You can also find them at lisalouisecook.com. You may notice that in the URL. When you get to the website, click on articles and you'll find all of our latest articles there. Um, I've written a couple. In fact, the one I just published while I'm recording this episode is how German address books at Ancestry.com are helping bust brick walls. This is really a case study of one of my own research projects that finally has blown the doors off of a brick wall that I've been working on for years. But even if you don't have German Ancestry, this article is for you. And the reason is I'm walking you through the process that I followed and I share with you a lot of different strategies that could be applied to any type of research. And uh, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at the tools and the strategies and the tips. It's probably the longest article I've written there on the Genealogy Gems blog. But it's just because there was just so much happening in such a compressed amount of time. And I really wanted to spell it out step by step so you could follow along with me and do it yourself. It's so exciting. I know. We love genealogy. <laughs> It's the best. So there's that. Of course, there's lots of articles on uh, new record collections as they're coming out. And I have my other article uh, not too long ago was, are you a cookie cutter genealogist? And uh, not only do we talk genealogy, but we talk cookies. I love cookies. 
All right, my friends. Hey, if you love this podcast, will you do me a favor? Will you tell your friends about it? (laughs) Will you go on Facebook and go, oh my gosh, I just listened to this podcast. Who knew about all this stuff about lists? Uh, Let folks know how to find us. And of course, that we have our Genealogy Gems app in the App Store. So it's super easy to find. Okay, well, you'll find me here again next month. And I'll be talking to all of you premium members in the premium podcast in just about two weeks. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.